the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have thought that. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit onstory.tv. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, Bloodline creator Todd A. Kessler. Bloodline starts as just a family drama, and then we tease out something by the end of the first episode that isn't exactly what you thought it might have been. So it was very atypical for most shows, and even in going out to sell it, uh, we started with that, which is they're not vampires, they're not serial killers, it's just a family. In this episode, Todd A. Kessler discusses the popular Netflix family drama he created, Bloodline. Over the years, we said, well, we'd really like to do something about family, and we decided to you take a, what seems to be a, a normal family from all uh, external appearances um, and really peel off layer upon layer to dig into what this family is uh, and who they are. And um, it ended up lending itself very well to a Netflix model where all episodes are released at, on, at one point because it, it allowed the audience to, or it allows the audience to sit with the characters and draw their own conclusions. Uh, and it also took, in a certain way, the pressure off of having to have huge events happen. Bloodline starts as just a family drama, and then we tease out something by the end of the first episode that isn't exactly what you thought it might have been when you first saw uh, this event happen. Um, all right, they killed their brother. I'll just get it out there. Uh, and, and then we, we just allow the audience to spend time with the characters. Um, so it was very atypical for most shows. And even in going out to sell it, uh, we started with that, which is they're not vampires, they're not serial killers. It's just a family. And as much as possible to have it be a, you could watch it with whoever you're sitting next to or talk to a friend after seeing an episode and feel like, I really like Kevin and John is a jerk and, you know, Meg doesn't understand. Like, people siding with, with different characters was something that was very exciting to us. The way that we have tended to work in the past is to get inspired by performances. And really, you know, you're working with actors, we don't know them, we don't really know where they're willing to go. Uh, how much they want to be challenged, how much they're willing to allow themselves to be challenged, how much they'll challenge us. Um, there's a scene in the, in the first episode of the series where they're arguing about the family table and Ben's character, Danny, wants to bring a date and they're all very uh, reticent to have him bring the date and have her sit at the family table. And it's this scene where just clearly the four siblings are arguing about it. And it was in that moment where you start to realize, oh, there's life here. What's the problem? Danny brought a date. Yeah, it's a big crisis. Glad you're here to sort it out. Though. Yeah, he wants her to sit at the family table. You know how mom and dad are about these things? She's not family. Well, I'm confused, because I'm family. Danny, don't, She's here don't, with me. Listen, don't, don't act like you don't know what you're doing. You know exactly what, am I doing? what you're what am I doing? doing. You're so full hey. of Am I, mean, I you know, doing? People can hear you. And after the after that scene, all four of those actors uh, at different points came up and spoke to us about how they were just so 
jerked off at their brother, you know, in real life. And they were projecting <laughs> some other thing about a different family fight and, you know, identity. And um, it's kind of like if you put a spotlight on any one of them, you could just go deeper. And that was something that is also really rare uh, to be able to feel that about a cast. Your life's not always going to be so perfect. So you're not going to beg me? Because if you're not going to beg, we don't have anything to talk about. When'd you get in, Danny? One of the things that I think you really seem to enjoy is riding against type. Um, because with Sissy and with Kyle and with Bo Bridges yeah. in the third season, you've got people who come in with certain personas and you complicate them. Um, tell us a little bit about what it was like to like take Kyle Chandler, America's sweetheart, and <laughs> turn him into a murderer. I think it's very freeing for them to jump into that. And it's very, you know, they're wildly talented and it's it's very inspiring to to lean into it, to play against that type, if they're willing to go there. And these actors were definitely willing to go uh, to uncomfortable places. Um, and there's trust, you know, that has to emerge to, to go there. Um, because they're, you know, I'm a writer and director. I'm way behind. No one cares what I look like. No one even knows who I am. I'm happy with all of that. Uh, but they're out there and it affects their careers if they take that chance and it doesn't work. Um, so it's understanding they're vulnerable, vulnerable to it. You did this. You did this, John. Sarah. And it's your fault. John, come on. You don't have to listen to this. Oh, yes, he does. Please, yeah. Don't you, John? Don't you? John. The good one. Let's go, man. You had no idea what family was. You never have. Hmm. Our desire in exploring uh, Sally Rayburn, you know, who Sissy plays, um, is that sh to reveal that she's actually the worst uh, and, and have her start. And it's similar in casting Kyle yeah. that people project onto Kyle um, from Friday Night Lights and also just him being Kyle, I guess. Um, <laughs> I wish I had like, you know, half a percent of that. Anyway, that's another, that's another panel. Uh, so, um, so for Sissy, it was very similar of, of, well, there's Sissy and isn't she sweet? And she runs this in and, you know, everyone comes down to this place to celebrate. And after time you start to realize that, yeah, she's the one she's, and, and she's the worst, you know, uh, in ways. And what we project onto people and what we think people's lives must be uh, or might be and how, um, whether it's the grass is always greener or you just have no idea what's going on in the histories and what's, uh, how people experience other people when you're really inside the private lives. So Sissy was extremely fearless in embracing that, uh, and very excited to embrace it and knew that that was coming. Um, and in the final episode of the series, um, she really lays into her kids and puts all the blame on them when it's really, uh, you know, she's at the, at the center of it. I want you to go. I want you to leave and not come back.
It's never worked out with you being here, has it? But why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know exactly. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you know. You know. Too many memories. In terms of the structuring of the story, we never wanted to get too far from the event of Danny's death. And when we went out to sell the show, we, we had planned five or six seasons. And the feeling was that maybe all five or six seasons could take place within a year. The idea was to have Danny's presence over the entire season or, or, or series. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have it thought exactly through what episodes and how that would go. And in the second season, he comes back and is um, a manifestation of John's, uh, you know, consciousness uh, and it felt like that played itself out and was useful. And then in the third season, um, John starts to really slide and becomes un unsure of what's real, is losing his grip on reality. Uh, but Ben's presence as Danny is definitely sh overshadowing the entire, the entire series. Um, and part of that is thematically this feeling of that, sibling or relative that you just hope doesn't come to Thanksgiving, regardless if you're that sibling or you're that person or you move 3,000 miles away to the other side of the country, they're still part of who you are. You can't escape it. And so trying dramatically to get this person's presence. Uh, and we, when we went out to sell the show, we talked about Danny as the black sheep. Uh, and the more we got into it, realizing that the black sheep of any family uh, is present in any all of the family members. It's not just like, we're all fine, but they're the black sheep. Well, they're coming from something. And in fact, the thing that they represent and embody, uh, we're probably much more vulnerable to and trying to you know, suppress in our lives than we're willing to admit. Um, so you know, the idea for, for Danny to be present in the series, even after his death, is something that is very important to us. Go do it, John. It doesn't have to end like this, John. He doesn't need to know. Just breathe through it. You got this. So what I hear you saying is that Danny is in some ways uh, just the most obvious manifestation of, you know, what Norbert talked about as the DNA of the Rayburn family. So right, everybody right. else is hiding. Yeah, and I mean, even the tagline that, that uh, we and Netflix decided to use to go out uh, and, and sell the show is we're not bad people, but we did a bad thing. It's like, well, first of all, you are bad people. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's not like, I'm, I'm just not someone who loses my keys. Well, you, you just have to lose your keys once, and you're someone who loses your keys. It doesn't... Uh, uh, but the... the um, if anything, maybe by the end of the series, one could draw... One, one could draw a conclusion that, in fact, the whole family are worse than Danny. Uh, but you're hearing about Danny through them. And so they're the ones saying, like, I mean, all of us have friends, and you're like, oh, my dad did this, my brother did that. Very rarely do you say, well, let me explore that. Let me talk to your dad and find out what his perspective is. You just accept it. So from the narrative storytelling point of view, it's hearing from John, who Kyle's character has a voiceover uh, at the top of the series, and he's talking about his brother, and you just accept that that's the truth. And then, ideally, if you watched the series and then went back to that first episode, you'd be like, oh, I see. That's not really entirely... He's not self-aware of what was going on. Uh, so we were playing with that as well in terms of perspective on storytelling. Norbert was performing in New York, and I went to go see him. He's as a, He had an album coming out, and I went to go see him, and... Before his performance, uh, we were we were talking, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, it's just, I mean, it's really, it's really hard. It's really hard to play Kevin." And and I just, um, I was like, "What? What is there a way that I can make it, you know, help help you out?" He's like, "No, it's just really hard when your your mom calls you up and it's like, you're so stupid. Why don't they just kill you?" <laughs> uh, 
so he really emb- embodied that, uh, whatever that is, um, and and wanted to not be as as dumb, but then really embraced it. Hey, oh I'm free. Oh, you are? That's right. I'm Congratulations. Free. Thank you. Congratulations on your freedom. Oh. What's he talking about? I got no idea what he's talking about. <sighs> Listen, you don't need to worry what I'm talking about, OK? The only thing that you need to worry about is that I'm free. Free. You're free. You're I am free. Congratulations. You're free and you're a drunken <laughs> idiot. And I'm free to be a drunken <coughs> idiot. <clears throat> hey, you got any blow? Really? Really? Cut him, cut him now? a Cut him a he's, His dad died, he's just, you know, and he's a drunken <laughs> idiot. <laughs> That's right. Dad just died. Why didn't we speak at the funeral? What? John did such a sterling job. How could I follow, how could I follow that? You don't believe that. You're so full of It was beautiful. You are so full of That was disgusting. That was horrible, man. My father would have hated it. Would have killed him. <laughs> You know, for Kevin, who's the youngest of these three brothers, uh, he's someone who's always looking to blame other people. It's yeah. always someone else's fault. And only, like, if he... It's just always someone else's fault. And even at the end of the series, he gets caught because his wife screwed up uh, and left her cell phone on, and they were able to track where they had escaped to. Uh, but... It's also interesting in working with that dynamic of, of actors because, you know, they're all trying to, uh, they all have their, their pride and they, they take on their character and then to be in that position where he's then blaming other people in life and, you know, among the siblings and it's like crosses lines over, you know, his perspective on it. But I think by the end, I mean, I think his performance in, in uh, the third season is just staggeringly beautiful. Uh, and there's a, there's a moment where, uh, without, well, it's going to ruin it. So he, uh, he's in a, in a huge predicament and he's unsure what to do. And he has a, a breakdown and calls his brother who he's just in the, uh, end of the second season has yelled at and basically said, it's never wanted to talk to you again. And not those words, but essentially that, and then has to reach out to his brother for help and just has this breakdown that, um, I think I think that was shot on the night of the election. Uh, and so Norbert was having a bit of a, a breakdown and was able to pour it into, uh, <laughs> into that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, my, that's, that's accurate. Oh, f- John. It's Marco, John. Marco's dead. He's dead, John. Give me a minute. I went over to Marco's house. I didn't I didn't have an option. We got into it. And now he's just he's just laying there. I don't think he's breathing. What the f- do you mean he didn't have a choice? And now Roy Gilbert's guy is waiting for me over at Marco's but I don't know. Sally and, and Robert never actually believed in Kevin. They always, you know, in a way put him down uh, because he paled in comparison to Danny's spirit of, uh, you know, at least Danny stood up to Robert. Uh, and, and John was someone who was, a, you know, an achiever to make up for Danny's uh, lack of achievement in a way. And then Kevin is there to just drink a lot and, and screw up. Ozzy's character is, is uh, played by John Leguizamo. Um, and that, that uh, we were really trying to explore this, this feeling of, could, can someone change? Uh, and so Ozzy enters the story, Leguizamo's character enters the story uh, in the second season. And from the initial pitch of the series, there was a, uh, we, had, we had pitched this idea that um, Danny gets killed and the family uh, thinks that that puts an end to their problems. But then what that unleashes, you know, if you want to get very grand, is this like sense of the, the Furies uh, and some Greek tragedy that someone can probably quote better than me. Uh, but so the Furies come down and, and wreak a lot of havoc because there's no justice for, for Danny's death. And Ozzy represents that. And then Ozzy goes through a change uh, where he's trying to get the Rayburns to admit what they did and to, to clear their conscience. And 
uh, he takes that on as a personal challenge, but he's also out of his mind and ends up in essence uh, being a martyr for himself, even though no one cares about him at all. Okay, come on, let's, let's, let's just cut to the chase, okay? Eric is not the killing type. We both know that. He's not like me, or the way I was anyway. And you know what? It's okay, because he's done plenty of that he never got busted for, okay? Eric has been walking around life weighted down by all the he's done. And he's finally caught up with him, and it's about time. But he's going to catch up with you too, Sally. I, I know you know this. I know you do, because you're a smart broad. The only thing is, I don't know if you're smart enough to know that you're running out of time. And so this sense of, like, I can't help other people, um, but you, I can try to help you save yourself, but you're not listening to me. And Ozzy's own very uh, checkered past with the relationship with his father and, you know, where all of these things come from uh, for the characters. So him killing himself as opposed to those two other people is because he realized that there's just no end. He's, he's if anything, it's more of potentially an honorable death than what Kevin, uh, he's more courageous than Kevin, John, Meg, Sally, you know, any of the Rayburns by taking his own life, knowing what he's done in the past. He can't live with his, his conscience and he can't save uh, people that he would like to try to save. Um, so in, in many ways, like there's a lot packed into that, uh, which would have benefited from more storytelling. Um, but we wanted to get to that place. Our desire was to really explore, can someone change? Can someone come to terms with their past? Will the world allow them to change and see them differently? Um, all of those things. So I know that you are a big fan of open endings. I know that you have talked even today about putting us in the character's shoes. Could you talk with us in these last few minutes about the decisions that you made about how to end the series and why you think it's a good one? Yes, yeah, so the end, uh, for those who haven't seen it, and I can explain it for even those who have, because people might be a little confused. Um, but the, the end of the series is John, Kyle Chandler's character, um, walking down a dock to finally um, interact with uh, Ben Mendelsohn's character's son, um, played by Owen Teague, who it's, is such a phenomenal actor. The exploration there was, what would you do if you were John? This feeling of John is now going to be confronted with, is he going to tell his nephew and come clean to his nephew that, uh, that John is the one who killed the nephew's father? Uh, and what's the right decision? You know, it will help maybe free John's conscience, but also if John doesn't tell him, then the nephew is, doesn't know the truth and the power of the truth and what's important. And so much in the Rayburn family has been an obfuscation of the truth. And, you know, the lack of honesty and lack of communication. So much of the third season is John in conflict with himself about what to do. He's someone who killed his brother. Uh, and how does he live with himself? And he ends up, his, his marriage breaks up, his relationship with his kids break up, his relationship with his siblings, for the most part, disintegrates. And now is this moment of, what do I do? For John coming to terms with, this is who I am, and what's best for me, what's best for my nephew, uh, and wanting to leave it in a place where we don't, we don't show the scene. Uh, and leave it to your own uh, imagination. And hopefully it's what you're saying. The open ending is what would you do and does it stick with you? If it doesn't stick with you, you know, obviously that's okay. But it, hopefully if you saw the scene, it felt like the scene would be less interesting um, if he, you know, in either way. And we had conversations about, well, maybe the nephew should kill John. At one point, Kyle really wanted to just uh, kill himself. Um <laughs> which is amazing how many actors want to kill themselves uh, in, their, in, their, in their roles. Uh, but the feeling was that there is, no, there is no answer. You know, you have to answer it for yourself. You, at the end, uh, I remember a line from The Sopranos that, uh, that Livia says to Anthony Jr., which is, in the end, we die in our own arms. Uh, and you're just alone and how you, live, how you live with yourself. And that's so much about what this series is. You've been watching a conversation with Todd A. Kessler, 
on OnStory. OnStory is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's OnStory project, including the OnStory PBS series, now streaming online, the OnStory radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the OnStory book series available on Amazon. To find out more about OnStory and Austin Film Festival, visit OnStory.tv or AustinFilmFestival.com.